what is going on everybody welcome back here to the channel i'm sean davis so welcome into the reveal of my 15th ranked team in my nba 2024 preseason power rankings with a deep dive into the cleveland cavaliers ladies and gentlemen welcome in appreciate you guys for stopping by make sure you guys if you are new hit that like button and subscribe here to the channel trying to hit 5,000 subscribers by the time the season starts i uh, really, really excited for the start of this NBA season. Go check out my breakdown of the massive trade involving the New York Knicks and the Minnesota Timberwolves last night at the time of this recording. A pretty wild trade. But today, like I said, we're diving into this Cleveland Cavaliers team, a team that I don't feel great about. Um, they have some really, really nice players individually, but I just don't feel good about this Cavs team. Uh, they had a really, really quiet offseason. So they are really, really just go on with this team right here um you know make sure you have support here the channel we have a bunch of great stuff here on the way with the season starting uh fully covering the entire league this is the first season i'm ever like really really locking in and covering the entire league so i'm really really excited really really appreciate your guys support and uh we are i'm going through a, a moving process right now so the background is going to change a lot and then uh to where it's not gonna be almost anything in the background for a couple of days and then uh, hopefully, for sure, by the time the season gets started, um, but hopefully like around preseason and things like that. So the next couple of weeks, we'll have the background fully set up and we'll get some cool announcements out to you for you guys. But en enough of the housekeeping. Let's break down this Cavs team. Uh, they come here in, in, in this power ranking series. They rank for me, like we already discussed, 15th in this year's power ranking series. Um, coming in with an 81.701 grade for me. So a pretty decent step up between them and my number uh, 16th ranked Golden State Warriors team. Had a bunch of fun breaking down that Warriors squad. Go check out that episode. Um, and yeah, they're, they're right in the middle of the league, in my opinion. Uh, this is the tier, again, of teams that I feel pretty comfortable that uh, are going to make the playoffs or at least can make the playoffs. Um, for these teams, anything less than making the playoffs, I think, would be a, a pretty major failure for these teams. Um, so, yeah, the Cavs, I don't know. Cavs fans, let me know what you guys think. If I'm coming in a little too low on this Cavs team or not with all the teams we still have uh, left remaining. But uh, let's start this off how we always start things off here with this uh, Power Rankings Deep Dive series by taking a look at the offseason recap, recapping what this team did, who they brought in, what they lost. And for the Cavs, I mean, they didn't, they literally didn't do much. The biggest thing that the Cavs did this offseason was firing JB Bickerstaff after another, uh, you know, subpar season. And, lot, you know, I, I think JB was kind of just on his way out in general because, truthfully, last season was just a really, really weird year, man. Uh, everybody, it felt like, got hurt. I mean, Darius Garland played 57 games last season and when he even when he was healthy he was still pretty clearly bothered Donovan Mitchell only played 55 games uh Evan Mobley only played 50 games uh Dean Wade even like 54 games uh you know Karis Levarez and Kuro both missed 10 plus games like it's, I mean Max Drews played 70 Jared Al played 77 but uh he didn't he didn't really have your guys healthy I mean, as much as you you would like them to. Um, and they still made it to the second round. And if injuries again didn't kind of get in their way, maybe they're able to steal an extra game or so from from the uh for, from the Boston Celtics, the eventual NBA champions in that second round matchup. So, you know, it's tough. I get it though. Um he goes to Detroit. We kind of broke down, excuse me, broke down JB Bicker seven that Pistons episode, but you're hoping you could get a little bit more modern thinking in here, uh, because with with you know JB, you're you're committing to the too big look with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen, and one of the reasons why I, I do think I'm a little bit lower on this Cavs team is because I, I I just don't buy in on the the fit with Jared Allen and Evan Mobley, or really just a fit for this team in general. Um, and we'll we'll talk about that stuff, but. Like I said, they they fire JB Bickerstaff, but then they bring in Kenny Atkinson, which is just super meh, honestly. Um, it's it's fine, um, but we I I just don't think this Kenny Atkinson really raises the floor of this group personally. 
Um, he's a good locker room guy. Like I think if you gave him some scrappy dudes, kind of like the, those older Nets teams, I think he, he did well with like the D'Lo and that squad that made the playoffs. Um, so I, I'm curious to see how Kenny kind of interacts with the stars here in Cleveland. That'll be interesting to see. And then, I mean, they lose Marcus Morris, who uh, unfortunately just kind of like states how much they, they were injured. Marcus Morris played 817 minutes last season, which is nuts. They lose him. Um, not really much to break down there, but they do they do bring in uh, Jalen Tyson. That's the only major player acquisition from this summer for the Cleveland Cavaliers is bringing in uh, is bringing in Jalen Tyson and and Jalen Tyson. I did wind up having a first round grade on Jalen Tyson. I wasn't in love with him, and it kind of took me a little. It took me a little bit longer. I think to to really come around on Jalen Tyson, I feel like he was a a draft analyst darling. Uh, I wound up having Jalen Tyson twenty sixth on my board at a you know late first, early second round grade on him. Uh, you know, the three point shot, in my opinion, was probably going to be the most translatable skill. Um, I really, really buy the connected playmaking ability, especially when attacking closeouts or in ball screen situations. Um, I think he has some defensive upside. You know, he's he's a pretty smart player, especially with like some of his gap discipline away from the ball. Um, I think he does have solid size for like a two or a three. Um, he was a pretty inconsistent finisher at, at times um, at, at Cal. And I, I do think his offensive bag, you know, you know, every once in a while can, can really turn into just shooting above a bunch of tough, you know, pull up jumpers. But it'll be kind of interesting to see Jalen Tyson's role kind of, you know, scale down a bit from what it was at Cal um, to being an NBA role player. And, and that's where I think you, you can't get a little more buy on the defensive side and see some more fun stuff from Jalen Tyson. Um, so, you know, it, it was a fine pickup. Uh, I think he can be a, a, a nice added like score to this bench, but you know, it's kind of crowded here, here in Cleveland with their bench. I think they have, uh, you know, solid bench players, but um, he he could actually kind of crack the rotation because they're gonna need some real scoring. Karis Lever, are we still kind of buying into Karis Lever as a player in twenty twenty four? Um, you know, he had a down year in in, in shooting, uh, shot thirty two point five percent from three last season per dunks and threes, coming off a three point thirty nine percent three point shooting season. So, uh, Jalen Tyson could definitely kind of steal some minutes here. But uh, let's dive in here and let's kind of start off this my, my roster breakdown with this Cavs team. And I'm going to kind of start things off by saying this. Um, I was on a, a, a pod, a podcast, uh, you know, not too long ago, maybe like a week or two ago now. And I, so I was asked a question about kind of my opinions about the Pacers and the Cavs, for example. And the best way I can really describe it is I like. The, the the that Pacers team makes so much more sense to me than this Cavs team does structurally, right? I think almost everybody compliments each other on that Pacers team. There's not this awkward ass fit, um, because truthfully, here in Cleveland, there's some really really awful fits, and I don't think we're able to like fully maximize everybody um, here in Cleveland. And it sucks because they kind of have to figure out a way. And they're hoping, I guess, it is Kenny Atkinson because you look at all the damn money they spent this summer. And, I mean, kind of surprising as a small market team. You look at look at the cat. I mean, they're not your typical small market team. They've, they've dealt with teams that had LeBron on it and things like that. So, you know, take that with a grain of salt, I guess, the Cavs being a small market team. But they're locked into Darius Garland's contract. He'll be a free agent after the 2027-28 season. Uh, Donovan Mitchell has a player option for that 27 28 season. Uh, Jared Allen is locked in until the end of 28 29. Uh, then you have Max Shrews locked into the end 26 27. Evan Moby locked into the end of 29 30. Like, uh, and also now they, they paid Isaac Okoro too here finally, locked into the end of 26 27. They are locked into this core that I'm, I'm really, and, and if I'm wrong about this take, I mean, okay, oh, well, um, I, I'll just be wrong about this one. Um, but I, I really, really don't think this Cavs team is 
I think they've hit their I think they've hit their ceiling. I truly believe that I think they've hit their ceiling with this current group, especially with the way the East is only getting better. We look at Philly, you look at Milwaukee, you look at Indy, you look at uh New York, you look at Boston, Boston on Boston, Philly, New York, uh Milwaukee, Indy, Orlando. I mean they are the seventh team that I'm breaking down from the Western Conference, uh, my seventh ranked Western uh, Eastern Conference team, excuse me, technically for doing like a standings list or whatever, for a reason. I don't think like, all these other teams, I think, are getting better while the Cavs are kind of stuck in, I don't want to say purgatory, but the Cavs are, I, I, I feel like, not really headed in the right direction. And I get paying some of these guys you don't want to let the asset kind of walk but man some of these guys like i don't know why they're calling darius garland's bluff dude just trade his ass because i don't think for the the best of not only darian darius garland but the best of this team i don't think it's pairing darius garland next to donovan mitchell this is the second straight situation where it's okay hey guy that needs the ball in his hands that's also a small guard next to darius garland Oh shit, that doesn't work. And we saw it didn't work with Colin Sexton, right? And the Cavs rightfully so chose Darius Garland in this scenario. But now they're back in another similar situation, but now it's instead of a Colin Sexton, it's a top 15 player in the league and Donovan Mitchell, and they're trying to pick both. And I just think picking both is going to end this, you know, revolving door that is like screaming at the calves this won't work it's just not and then we're not even talking about the too big situation yet which i i hate especially when we're talking about all the freaking money you just paid evan mobley i i you, you paid evan mobley all this money i'm not even mad at it actually you paid Evan Mobley all this money to be to like not properly maximize him because I really think Evan Mobley to fully maximize him. I think he needs to be the five for this team, and that. But instead, you give an extension to Jared Allen. So now Jared Allen's now locked in for five more years on this contract. Jared Allen's a really good player, as I hope I'm indicating here by giving him an 80 overall grade. Really, really good defender brings value offensively like i'm 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 out i mean I, I don't know if i've had a take this strong so far in this series but like i i just don't see it with the calves um with like some i, I just don't see it with the calves i i don't see it with the raptors i think that's the i think that's the other team so far that i've like really planted my flag and said yeah i'm kind of out on them and you know, both teams, you know, the Raptors would be more like playing conversation, but I mean, I just, I just don't really see a world where the Cavs surpass my kind of expectation of them being a first round exit or, or, you know, not even a first round exit, but a team that's already peaked in terms of how far they can go, which is a second round exit, in my opinion, which is what we saw last year in year two of this group. And that was after surviving a seven game gauntlet against the Orlando Magic, the up and coming Orlando Magic, who we have not even talked about yet in this series. So, and, and again, for going for projecting, I mean, again, clearly, because we haven't talked about him yet, I like that Magic team a whole hell of a lot more than I like, uh, <laughs> like the, the Cavs right now. Maybe a whole hell of a lot more is a bit of a stretch, but you get the drift. Um, Dive into the roster breakdown. Obviously, we got to talk about some of the uh, tiers here. So, Kenny Acton, tier six for me, I think. Uh, and getting a C for me for uh, the coach. 23rd through 27th in the league. I think he's an okay coach. I, I think schematically there were some some rough stuff from, from Brooklyn. Um, I think there there's, you know, some stuff that's, like, great. But the consistency, the overall – um like systems i think he was implementing I, I just what that kind of impressed by with kenny atkinson um although i'm kind of curious to see what what he's maybe taken from golden state he passed up on the charlotte job last season to go back to golden state and now he lands here in cleveland so really really curious to see and maybe honestly if you want to put the green arrow up on kenny atkinson i wouldn't blame you um so we we, we talked about three different teams like the hornets the raptors and the nets for coaching and kind of a different 
outlook on Kenny Atkinson compared to those other three coaches that were in this tier. Um, and then the bench tier four C plus 14th to 19th. This is a pretty adequate NBA bench. Like, like I said, C plus perfectly like fine bench. Um, they got some fun pieces, you know, you have Isaiah Crow, good defender, Dean Wade, uh, Joris Niang, uh, Tristan Thomas is like the backup big, which I don't love, but, uh, like I said, they also have, they also have Jalen Tyson, Craig Porter, um, as kind of backup one, you're hoping he can, you know, maybe step up and get real minutes, you know, undrafted player last season out of Wichita state. A uh, solid playmaker played in 51 games for this Cavs team last season. Ty Jerome's here too. Sam Merrill, like they have, they have it's a fine bench, pretty fine NBA bench. Um, and then defensively, uh, they're going to come in for me in my tier three of NBA uh, defenses, ranking eighth to 19th in the league, right at the top of this tier. Actually, um, I will say if JB Bickerstaff was here still, this team would be in my tier two of NBA defenses, which currently is fourth to seventh. So j- just a little, you know, extra tidbit there. Uh, JB's a really, really good defensive coach, I think. Uh, Kenny's fine. And, and I mean, tier three, eight, eight to 13 is still great. That is essentially a championship defense. I think if you're a top 13 defense, it's actually pretty much historically proven over the past uh, 25 plus years now. Uh, I want to say dating all the way back to 97. Uh, there's only been two teams since 97 to win an NBA championship without a top 13 defense. That would have been the, I want to say 2001 Lakers. Or maybe it was, yeah, 2001 Lakers. Cause that was the Lakers team. That was pretty banged up with injuries. And then the, but that defense was the second best defense come playoff time. And then the nuggets most recently, they won the title, but that team, you know, stopped caring in March and that tanked their defensive rating. Um, but you know, they were like what 14th, I think, a defensive rating that year. And then once again, come playoff time, that was a really, really good defense. So top 13, pretty much championship quality defense. Um, although some of the teams outside of that, you know, do have some concerns with them. But uh, all right, what well, let's uh let's dive in here fully, finally, to kind of the roster breakdown and my thoughts on these individual players. And the conversation obviously starts with Donovan Mitchell. Um, he gives his team a massive multiplier boost um, that you guys can see in kind of the bottom right hand corner. Him and him and Evan Mobley give this team a, a superstar boost, if you will. Uh, I do think they are the two best players on this team. And Donovan Mitchell, what more can't be said about Donovan Mitchell? Completely, 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 you know, warranted of that massive extension uh, he got. And honestly, look at some of the other contracts that are going around the league. I mean, yeah, he'll be what thirty-one by the end of this deal. But compared to you know some of these other deals that are going around, fifty-three million dollars for a thirty-one-year-old Donovan Mitchell, it could be a whole hell of a lot worse than now. Just say that um, he is such a dynamic offensive player with the ball in his hands. You know. I don't know. There's a tweet I want to say from NBA University that was like, uh, what's like the super specific, you know, maybe even weird trait that one player is just super special at for it. And for example, Kevin Love, uh, like outlet passes and stuff like that, right? Or touchdown passes, outlet passes. Donovan Mitchell, it's like splitting pick and rolls. I don't know how many players in the league are better at specifically the splitting pick and rolls and playing at a freak athletic pace from that point. Like, Ja comes to mind, but Ja, anything that requires athleticism, Ja is going to be at the top of the list. Uh, plays with such great pace, has, is super efficient as a, as a pull-up jump shooter, um, whether it's at a ball screen, it's at an ISO, legit shake and wiggle too. Um, can get downhill essentially whenever he wants. Um He's a really, really good playmaker. I don't think he's a, you know, elite playmaker, but he's a he's a really, really damn good one. Um, finishes through contact really, really well. He he doesn't do like the the younger guard thing. And Donovan Mitchell's kind of a vet at this point. I mean, like like we say, he's twenty seven, going on twenty eight. Might already be twenty eight actually. 
Um, but the thing that kind of drives me crazy is like with younger guards is they avoid contact a lot of times. It's uh, like embracing it, going chest to chest and just finishing straight through the defender. So Dalvin Mitchell's meeting you at the rim. Um, plays incredibly well. The the driving ability really opens up his playmaking game. Um, and, you know, he's creating a lot of his shot attempts at the rim. 90% of his uh, field goal attempts at the rim are unassisted. That's insane. The amount of rim pressure that Donovan Mitchell is able to achieve while also being a good finisher at the rim, despite the fact that teams don't give a damn about the two big lineups that they'll run with Evan Mobley and Jared Allen. Um, you know, you would like to see him fully evolve as an off-ball player. I think part of the, the fit stuff with – with him and Garland, I think it's it is a little bit on Donovan Mitchell because of just how elite, dare I say elite, he is with the ball in his hands. It's it's just hard to take him off the ball at times. And uh there is a fairly dramatic drop off from his effectiveness with the ball in his hands with than than off the ball in his hands, where you know, I do think at times, you know, he'll just kind of, you know, get in I, I think he'll just kind of disappear if he's off the ball um, and not really be as active and engaged as he would want him to be. Um, but when he is off the ball, he's a really, really good catch and shoot three point shooter shot 41 uh, per B ball index shot 41.8% on catch and shoot threes last season. Uh, he's very easily the best player here in Cleveland. Um, like I said, he created an ISO. The only thing with Donovan Mitchell is I'm not, quite sure if he's a 1A on a championship team. I, I know for sure, without a, a doubt, I know he's a 1B. I know Donovan Mitchell's a 1B. Um, we're like, on a night-to-night -night basis, he can be your best player. But, like, he has a really, really good floor being, like, your second best player. I know for sure he's a 1B. Um, I, I don't, like, like, him and Devin Booker, very, very similar to your players. But I don't know if he's the best player on a championship team all the way. And honestly, I think he's a very matchup dependent guy come playoff time. Uh, or it's really just weird, I think, with Donovan Mitchell because you look at Donovan Mitchell's kind of playoff runs, and he's had some flat out brilliant playoff performances. I think this year he was freaking incredible in the playoffs where. He really put the team on his back where Darius Garland was struggling and couldn't buy a basket to save his life. It was Donovan Mitchell that said, all right, time for me to be Superman, time to put the cape on and, you know, help carry this team to, to victory. And he did that numerous times throughout the playoffs. Game six, even though they didn't win, he had 50 points on 61% from the field. Ridiculous efficiency. Then in game seven, closed out game at home, 39 points, nine boards, five assists. Then in Boston, he was averaging, before he got hurt and missed the rest of the series, he was averaging 32, six and five on 51 and 51% 50, uh, from the floor and 53% from three. Like, he was playing at a absurd level this playoff run. But then you get a last year, and he, he was awful for the most part in that next series. Incredibly inefficient. Shot 43% from the field, 28.9% from three. Average, he had a, you know, a less than a two-to-one assist turnover ratio. It's kind of this back-and-forth thing. I mean, in in to round out his Utah tenure, 39% from the floor, 20.8% from, from three in that Dallas series in 2022, 21-22. But then you have the playoff series, the playoffs before that, where he was phenomenal again. Great run against Memphis and the Clippers. They just lost. And then obviously, we know, the bubble where he had multiple 50-point playoff games, a 44-point game six, and a, a couple of 30, uh, 30 pieces thrown in there as well. So it's, it's kind of weird with Donovan Mitchell. I think he's a fine defender, too. Um, you, you hope with, with the money you're paying him, you're hoping he's a 1A. But again, I don't know if they're really even surrounding him with the pieces for him to be a 1A and for him to, to try to take this team to the next step and elevate them in the Eastern Conference. So um, that that's kind of just my take on, on Donovan Mitchell. And then Darius Garland, 
Look, man, if you're a team that needs a that needs a point guard that can kind of set the table for everybody, can be a scorer when you need him to be, but he is a table setter and an expensive one at that, sure. But they can also knock down the three ball. Um, I think partially kind of raise his stock in the playoffs, but but for the most part, this would be a a buy low, you know, type of a trade. If you're a team like that, like I'm trying to think, like San Antonio, I thought would have made a bunch of sense for Darius Garland um, until they got Chris Paul. And I was like, okay, well, there goes that. I guess the problem is with with kind of that hypothetical I threw out, how many teams need that kind of archetype? And that's a very, very legitimate question to ask. But I'm I'm still a believer in Darius Garland, man. I, I really, really am. Um it, you know, last season was rough for Darius Garland. He obviously, uh, I want to say, what, fractured his jaw. Um, and, and that really, really affected him. Um, came back, wasn't the same, and really, really, like, took him a while to get back going. Um, you know, he missed over a month of playing time. His last game before the injury was uh, December 14th. Didn't return till January 31st. And it just took him a while to really, really get back going. And um, I don't think we ever really did see him get back going. I mean, he had the month of March where he played pretty well, 18 points, seven assists per game, shot 43% from the field, um, but was super inconsistent in the playoffs. But again, it's just because, and, and it's kind of funny, you see him in the game without Donovan Mitchell in the playoffs. Now, game five, he didn't shoot the ball well at all. But game four, he was trying to put the team on his back. He had 30 points, seven assists in that game five. I'm sorry, game four against Boston. Him and Evan Mobley kind of, you know, carrying carrying the ship. Uh, he had a good game five against uh, against Orlando. Had 23, five and five. The I'm hoping with a full off season now, like he's healthy. Donovan Mitchell's healthy. The one saving grace is this is you're, you're going to get a real off season. You're, you're hoping you can kind of remodernize this offense with, you know, Kenny Atkinson at the helm here and, you know, check ball. Cause we have a guy that can maybe even make Donovan Mitchell's life easier. And that was kind of the pitch with a guy like Darius Garland, who has an incredible handle can really, really shoot the three ball, like we mentioned. Great floater game. Um, it just hasn't all the way came together with Darius Garland. That's unfortunate. Again, has to stay healthy. Um, and, yeah, I mean, another instant paid touch guy. Another guy that you would like to, to, to finish it at the rim. He's kind of the opposite of, of Donovan Mitchell, um, where he's not this ultra-aggressive finisher, but he's a really, really good downhill driver. Again, really, really opens up his playmaking game nicely. A ridiculous 44.9% of his drives leads to a pass out. And uh, 13.2%, he has a 13.2% drive assist rate, meaning 13.2% of his drives lead to an assist, which ranks in the 85th percentile per B-ball index, which is awesome. Again, he, he has the shiftiness and the handle really get downhill and help manipulate defenses. He's honestly probably like in that tier two for me of like NBA playmakers. Um, took us some of a step back defensively, but he has really, really good hands in the passing lanes. Um, I like Darius Garland, man. I, I really, really do. I hope he's able to, to have a full year healthy. Uh, he's never played 70 games his entire NBA career. The closest he came would have been 2023, which – Ironically, it's probably the best year of his career. Highest assist percentage, uh, highest estimated wins per dunks and threes, highest EPM per dunks and threes, highest three point percentage. So please, Darius Gollin, stay healthy. And I'm I'm gonna be watching closely with this Cavs team this year. I really, really am because I hope that somebody is able to just pounce on uh that he's able to just pounce on. Uh, Darius Garland kind of buy low on Darius Garland and he he rewards them. Um, if this is just what he is, then that contract kind of looks a little ugly because although I do think he is a you know maybe fringe, I do a great amount as an all star, so I'll give it to him like all star offensive talent. You know, 
it, it could also kind of start to go the other way, and he is just this really overpaid version of D'Angelo Russell. Um, and I guess that's my Laker Twitter in me coming out, which that's kind of the comfort Darius Garland at times you see on Twitter. Um, so I, I like Darius Garland a lot. I hope he's able to kind of turn it around. And they got Max Struess here. And, and Max Struess, Miami darling, one of the very few Miami Heat players to kind of leave Miami and and uh, turn into and wind up still being a good NBA player where it seems like everybody else leaves Miami and, you know, drops off the freaking Mount Everest. Max Struess leaves Miami and is still a really, really good player. Um, I, I, I really, really hope that we get to see – you know, Max Struess kind of used in a in a clay ish role um, where, you know, they're running him off creative actions, running him off of post splits and where he gets to uh, set the reject screen and he gets to pop back and gets the shots and stuff like that. They can really you can really, really get in your bag with, you know, some of the three man actions with him and Donovan Mitchell or Garland's the ball handler than Jared and Mobley. And we saw that a lot last season for Max Struess. Um you know, and, and I think there's this thing where, you know, with, with movement shooters or whatever, like, oh, man, you know, you're a movement shooter, but you can't play defense. Shrews competes, man. Like, he is not a slouch defensively in the slightest, right? I think he does his job. I think he's in the right spots fairly often. Um, he navigates greens pretty well, especially in on-ball scenarios. And, again, I think JB did a really, really good job of, you know, hiding some of these guys' weaknesses. Um, to where, you know, a three-man lineup of, of Dom and Mitchell, Darius Gullen, and Max Schroes can really, really work. And kudos to JB um, to where in lineups with, with you know, Max Schroes on the floor, looking at some of the lineup data here now, in lineups with Max Schroes on the floor last season, the Cleveland Cavaliers in terms of, uh, you know, points per 100 possessions, they were a plus five. They gave up only 111 points per possession. You know, the top lineups, the, the best lineup for this team that they had was Dominic Mitchell, Max Schroes, Isaac Okoro, uh, Dean Wade, Jared Allen. Played a lot of minutes. Another pretty popular one uh, would have been Dominic Mitchell, Max Schroes, Karis LeVert, Dean Wade, Jared Allen, or Garland, Mitchell, Struess, Dean Wade, Jared Allen. That lineup, 112 minutes played together, uh, sorry, possessions played together, plus 25. Max Strus is a legit positive defensively. Uh, I think we can say that. Maybe I'm selling him short by giving him a C plus defensive grade here, but I think he's I think he's pretty solid, man. I think he's solid. I don't think they have a true weak link. I mean, I think Garland's probably the worst defender here, but I mean, even then, Garland has some redeeming qualities here, so they have a really, really nice floor. I think defensively. And then you got Evan Mobley. And Evan Mobley is the one guy that can kind of make this, like, thing go apeshit and, like, really turn this ranking upside down and make me look like an idiot. Um, but, again, I still think that to get to there, that point, you need Evan Mobley to be the five long term. But Evan Mobley, uh, first off, wow, what a freaking playoff run. I was going back and kind of rewatching the film from Evan Mobley and, and like I do for all, for the, for all these guys heading into this series, um, especially when I get to these teams or whatever. And I just feel even more confident about what Evan Mobley is able to do. Um, you know, when you, when you look at him in that playoff run and cause what he was doing is truly phenomenal. Now the big thing with Evan Mobley is he is still, the offensive game is still coming along. Um, I think he has some redeeming qualities as an offensive player. Um, I think he's a really good offensive rebounder. I think he's a really, really good play finisher and able to finish above the rim. The three-point shot, you just want him to be a little more confident with the three-point shot, honestly. Um, he, he's an active cutter and things like that, like in the dunker spot and, and things like that. Has good timing and is a really, really good screen setter, I think. Um, the post up game and any of the self creation stuff just is still super super developmental still, um, but he's a developing playmaker to where he's able to like he's starting to be able to process stuff as a short roll playmaker or if he does get a post touch and they and they double him because it's a it's a cross match he is slowly kind of developing some of that stuff, 
Um, but the, the obvious progression is like, dude, can you can you be for this pairing to work consistently with him and uh, with with him and, and Evan Mobley? Can can you really really be a knockdown three point shooter? And that's what it's going to come down to for Evan Mobley. Um, it, that's the biggest thing, right? But you go to game five of that playoff series against Boston, and you're like, oh, okay, so there's the self-creation. He had 33 points in game five. No Donovan Mitchell. Uh, I, I want to say no Jared Allen as well, if I can if I can recall correct. Yeah, no Jared Allen. Garland flopped. Garland did not have a good game. And it was Evan Mobley, go hoop. Evan Mobley, go create. And he put on probably the best offensive performance of his NBA career thus far. Um, but then also, like I said, defensively, like go cut on game seven of that Magic game. And his timing is so absurd. Um, his hands is, is so absurd. Um, but he also has the lateral quickness he has the the build and the frame to be able to guard and, and keep up with wings and things like that and be incredibly versatile that's probably the best thing this team like the best reasoning they have for continuing to to play him and and, and jared allen together is you could get really really versatile get pretty creative with some of your defensive schemes with him and jared allen playing together um and and that's cool and the contract he got, you are projecting, you are projecting forward and continuing like the offensive progression. And that's again probably where the Kenny Atkinson hire makes the most sense is player development and what he is able to do with guys like Evan Mobley and to a lesser degree like Darius Garland at this point. Great rim protector, like I already mentioned. And he's one of, I think I did a list. I gotta find it really fast. He's he's one of the 10 best defenders in the league currently. Um, I don't think that's a hot take. Um, great defensive rebounder has great positioning on, for for box downs and things like that. Um, again, if if, Cle- if if Evan Mobley takes a big offensive jump this season under Kenny Atkinson, then okay, this ranking is in is in some trouble, and uh, I, I'll be I'll be watching for you know what we what what's to come here with with Evan Mobley in particular he's still only 23 years old uh he's a young 23 at that like he just turned 23 back in June so you know we'll be we'll be we'll be really really watching him closely heading into this upcoming season um gotta cut back on the turnovers still like like I say he's a growing playmaker uh but he's willing to incredible defender and I think he's the best defender on this team for sure but Jared Allen does not get enough love incredibly underrated you know, also a really, really good shot blocker and rim protector. Defensively, they're able to do a lot, a lot of the cool stuff they're able to do because they have Jared Allen on this team. Um, and I, I do wish he got the credit he deserved. It, it, it just, it, it's just unfortunate because for the Cavs' long-term future, it's not very conducive to their success to be playing. 6'11 Jared Allen that can't shoot next to current 6'11 Evan Mobley that isn't an effective shooter. Evan Mobley turns into an effective shooter out of nowhere. Okay, then bam, this pairing can kind of work a little bit more. And by effective shooter, I mean one that the defense has to actually worry about, which at the moment it's not the case. Um, but then defensive, uh, sorry, uh, going to kind of this bench group here, they have a guy in Dean Wade who is probably the best defender that nobody talks about in the entire league. Dean Wade is a legit 6'10". It might even be 6'11", but legit 6'10". And he, not only is he 6'10", and you think like, oh man, 6'10", like, is, all right, we're, we're mostly looking at shot block or rim protectors and things like that. Maybe you're looking at, you know, a bigger wing stopper and things like that, right? When, when we're talking about guys that size. No, he's he's probably this team's third best defender on this team. Um and he's he's the wing stopper, but he can legitimately guard 1 through 5 and he can get skinny and has good technique when guarding ball screens. Can keep up in space and guard in one-on-one isolation and things like that. One thing I forgot to mention with Jared Allen is another reason why like 
the Jared Allen, Evan Mobley thing defensively is still really, really cool. Jared Allen is a really, really good post defender where you can kind of not have to, you know, have Evan Mobley, you know, be entirely in charge of that. That was one other point I wanted to bring up. Um, but Dean Wade, also a pretty solid post up defender as well. Offensively, you know, he's essentially just asked to, to knock down, catch and shoot threes, which he he does. He does that at a, at a pretty fine rate. Um, last season per B-ball index, shot 38.2% on catch and shoot threes and 41.3% on corner threes. That's all this Cavs team needs him to do, and he does that. Then you're able – that, that's where you get the lineups where, okay, it's him and, you know, Evan Mobley on the floor together, and it works. Or it's him and Jared Allen on the floor together, and it works, right? Because he is such a he, – he plays his role so perfectly well, and it just makes sense. And, you know, we didn't get to see too much of it because of injuries, things like that. They only played 449 possessions. But I'm looking at this top, you know, group right here for them. Uh, that performed well, at least 43 possessions. Donovan Mitchell, Max Schroes, Karis LeVert, Dean Wade, and Evan Mobley, plus 12.3 points per 100 possessions. You know, this is a really, really fun player, man. One of the more underrated players in the entire league. Doesn't get talked about enough. Uh, super, super good player, man. Great hands as well. This is, not, this is a pretty common theme here uh, in Cleveland. Uh, next, you got Karis LeVert, who... Does a good job at kind of being a slasher and getting to the rim. You know, pretty common theme of guys that create their own shot for themselves, getting to the rim. He's an adequate playmaker. Uh, I'm just not going to, you know, get overly amped up and excited about Karis Levert in 2024. He's fine. Um, he's, you know, eight. he's age 29 now at this point. And, and Isaac Okoro is such a frustrating player um, because he is – for the most part, a pretty bad offensive player. Um, like the shot has just never really been consistent. He's a bad finisher. Doesn't really have like the playmaking at all. Um, teams are willing to, to leave him wide open. You know, the shot quality he gets, like he shot the ball well, but his shot quality is so amazingly high. So he's just shooting catch and shoot threes because the defense doesn't give a damn about him. And knows that he's not really going to do much with the ball in his hands either. Now, that doesn't detract from what he ta- what he does and what he contributes defensively. Because defensively, Isaiah Koro, again, really, really good balls on ball defender. You know, guarding in, in isolation, guarding in ball screens. Can chase off ball screens as well, pretty, pretty well. Um, defensively, from like a perimeter standpoint, he doesn't have a lot of weaknesses. It's it's pretty much everything that involves touching a basketball on the offensive end. Um, he, he gets a contract extension. I think that's honestly more or less so they don't lose the asset. Now, uh, you know, he's eligible to be traded in January. If this thing doesn't pan out and, and it, you know, stays at the, the current level or maybe even gets worse, I could see them potentially shipping Isaac Okoro. But, uh, you know, we'll see. And it's it's interesting with Isaiah Coro. And then other guys, we already talked about Jalen Tyson. George Niang is fine. Solid depth piece at this point. Um, not not much else really to talk about here for, for this for this Cavs team. Um, so let's kind of wind down here and break down uh, our strengths and weaknesses for this Cavs team, along with our Vegas over under odds. Uh, strength number one for me is the backcourt scoring. Even though the fit is a little clunky at times, Dominic Mitchell and Darius Garland, from a pure scoring standpoint, is incredible. Uh, front court depth. I, I mean, not, sorry, not front court depth. Front court defense. I mean, th- the amount of guys, but specifically Evan Mobley, Jared Allen. The offense. That's the clunky fit. The offense. You know, we'll talk about that literally in a second. But defensively, with those two guys, able to do so much cool shit. And you have a top ten defender in Evan Mobley and like a top twenty defender in Jared Allen. Two really, really good defensive players that would easily be defensive anchors on pretty much every team in the league. Um, and then the wing depth. I think they have good wing depth here legitimately. Max Schroes, Isaiah Okoro, Kara Silver, Dean Wade, Jalen Tyson. They have good depth here, specifically at that wing spot, I think. Um, and then looking at kind of the weaknesses, I think just obvious fit 
concerns and the lack of addressing fit concerns and actually leaning into said fit concerns even more, I think kind of leads into a to weakness that isn't on here, but it's the fact that the East is only getting better. Boston's the defending champs, so they're going to get the respect. Uh, New York just added Carl Anthony Towns last night. And the Knicks also added Mikael Bridges and OG Ananobi since the trade deadline, while also having a top 12-ish player in Jalen Brunson. Um, Philly adds uh, Paul George to a, a two-headed monster in, in Maxi and Embiid. Milwaukee has the second-best player arguably in the league in Giannis, and Damian Lillard is still Dame. Orlando's young and up and coming. Indy's coming off a conference finals appearance. Miami is still Miami. Like the East is only getting better. And the fact that not only are we not really addressing these fit concerns and calling everybody's bluffs and thinking that Donovan Mitchell and Darius Garland can work and the two big thing with Jared Allen and Evan Mobley in 2024 can continue to work unless Evan Mobley takes a big step forward as a you know jump shooter and offensive creator in general. Like leaning into these fit concerns isn't doing anything for you. And it's so frustrating. Um, to watch this Cavs team that honestly has good players, but like just continue to lean into stuff that I'm just don't think is going to work. Um, although they have like good solid depth and that's really kind of where like their, their grade comes in for their, their bench overall or whatever. Um, the bench scoring kind of concerns me like Karras is fine, but like, it's Karis Avert and there's what Jalen Tyson when we're looking for real bench scoring. And I guess maybe I'm selling Karis Avert a little bit short, um, but the, the bench scoring does legitimately concern me. And then the backup big spot, like Dean Wade can guard one through five. Yeah. Niang is your, you know, backup five or is it Tristan Thompson? So that's also t- something to be somewhat concerned with. Um, and then, you know, health for crying out loud. We, we just talked about this. Darius Garland's never played 70 games. Don Mitchell coming off a, game, a season where he played 55 games, and he hasn't played 70 games since his sophomore season. Um, Evan Mobley played 50 games last season. Jared Allen, he was, relative, he was actually pretty healthy last season, played 77 games, but then got hurt in the playoffs. This team has to freaking stay healthy. Um, they have real injury concerns here, specifically with their three best players. So that's also something else to be pretty concerned with with this team. Um, over under odds and, and Vegas, you know, projections here. NBA Finals plus four thousand. I, I think you're losing money if you try to put money on that. Like uh, you're just asking for Vegas to just take your money and more power to you, I suppose. Um, to come out of the East plus eighteen hundred. Again, you're asking Vegas to take your money um, to make the playoffs minus fifteen hundred. I mean, okay, yeah, like if this seems healthy, I you know, be pretty hard to imagine this team not making the playoffs. Something catastrophic would have had to happen again, like an injury, I think. And then the Vegas over under set of 48 and a half. I'm not playing any of these, but this is the one I would play. And I would lean under because based off my ranking, like I said, I have them as the seventh best team in the East. I like Boston, Orlando, Indiana, Milwaukee, uh, Philly, and New York, all more than Cleveland. It's a seventh best team in the Eastern Conference, a 48 or 49 win team. I don't think so. So if we're going off this off this series, I'm going to play the under on this one. I'm going to go under on, you know, the Cavs over under win total projections, which right now is set at 48 and a half. This is all per FanDuel. So thank you guys so, so much for watching here and tuning in to my number uh, 15th ranked team, my preseason power rankings, which is the Cleveland Cavaliers. You know, this series is continuing, going to continue, uh, record a, a few more episodes here before the move. And then we're going to hopefully we're going to get to the top 10 here really, really soon, guys. So hope you guys appreciate the series. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe to the channel for more great content. And I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out.